Uh, at last, the Battle of Marawi is over after five months. I remember when it broke out first on May 23 that the military leaders said it will be over in three days. And of course, that did not happen. It was a gross underestimation of the strength and force of the enemy. So instead, it extended and went on for five months. Now, we are talking of another battle, a more fierce battle as far as spiritual forces are concerned. Now, are we to think that that battle is now over? And I'm talking about the battle that began in 1517. And if you are to be strict about it, it goes back to the New Testament. And still, it goes back to the Garden of Eden. When we have the first question mark of the Bible, has God truly said? Talaga bang sinabi ng salita ng Diyos? So the question is, are we still in the battle that began way back in the Garden of Eden that exploded with the coming of the Lord Jesus in His first coming? And then we find the peak of it in the 16th century Reformation. So we are asking here the question, is the 16th century Reformation for the 21st century. After all, it has been 500 years since that Martin Luther in October, on October 31, 1517, posted or nailed his 95 Thesis on the church door of uh, his church in Wittenberg in Germany. There was nothing extraordinary in the act of nailing a piece of paper on the door of his church at that time. If Martin Luther were to do it in 15, in 2017, he would have to post on Facebook and then it will go viral. But back then, there was only the public plaza as well as church doors to make your uh, announcement public, your invitation and your notices. Not many know that Martin Luther, in fact, six months before, October 31, 1517, posted another piece of paper known then as the 97 Thesis. Who has heard of it? No one. Walang nakarinig noon, and that is because there is nothing extraordinary about nailing one's thesis. Uh, but just a warning to my fellow preachers, it means if you go two extra points in your preaching, it will always go unnoticed. Uh, ganyan ang nangyari sa 97 thesis ni Martin Luther. So, we know what was extraordinary of Martin Luther's 95 Thesis was not the act of nailing, it was the content that was there on the piece of paper. The 97 Thesis, six months before, was about scholasticism. But this one was an attack against indulgence. So Pastor Ellis mentioned the invention of the printing press some years back. Uh, did you know that the first piece of publication from the printing press was a papal indulgence and second only was the Gutenberg Bible. So you can imagine, out of the same invention came the piece of falsehood that Luther will attack with his Reformation. And out of the same invention came the Bible. And you have here the reality of using the same uh, technology but with different purposes and different sources. Now that we are asking the question, has that, was that event something that still is relevant for us today? Fast forward 499 years after 1517 and that means only last year. Uh, in 2016, Pope Francis and the Reverend Martin, it's pronounced as Junge, General Secretary of the Lutheran World Federation, embraced on October 31, 1516. So what happened 500 years before, they are trying to outdo 499 years later. They committed themselves to a communion in the Eucharist, something that Martin Luther did just the opposite uh, some 499 years before. Now, is this the correct option for churches today to go to unification with the Roman Catholic Church. Now let us look at some data about American Protestantism today. According to the Pew Research Center survey of American religious knowledge, 53% of U.S. Protestants 
could not identify Martin Luther as the one who started the Reformation. So that's, more, uh, that's the majority of Protestants in America today could not even identify the significance of Martin Luther. And fewer than 3 in 10, that's less than 30% of 10 white evangelicals correctly identified sola fide as a Protestant distinctive. Now what we can say is that what was started in 1517 is fast fading in our day, in our generation. Now again, the question we are seeking to answer is, is that a good development or is this a retrogress from what Martin Luther started? Then look at the comparison. This is the evangelical column. This is the Roman Catholic column about the belief that is held by evangelicals and Catholics on the, other, on, the, on the one hand, the evangelicals, and on the other hand, the Catholics concerning sola fide and sola scriptura. And this is the This is the data we are interested in, where it shows that only 30% believe in both among evangelicals. Only 30% believe in both sola fide and sola scriptura, while another 35% split on whether to believe sola fide but not sola scriptura, or just sola scriptura and not sola fide, and another 35% believe neither. And we're talking here of those who are supposed to be the heirs of the Reformation. And this certainly is a tragic reality in our day. And this is what, again, we are asking the question, are we to consider this as a development, or is this a retrogress from what was started in 1517? So let us begin with scriptures that tell us in 1 Timothy 6, 20 and 21, Paul telling Timothy, O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. So that which is entrusted to you, in other translations, this is simply the deposit. And that deposit is re uh, referring to what is that cluster of truths, that cluster of beliefs that make for the Christian gospel. And Apostle Paul tells Timothy that one thing that he must exercise with all diligence, and he uses an emotional language here, it's not always that you find Paul using an address with that emotional element of O Timothy. And that point that Paul is trying to press on Timothy is guard what was committed to your trust. He warns him against anything that will stray away from the focus. There can be issues, controversies, not worth his while. Timothy must rather focus on what was most important, and that was whatever would touch the deposit, whatever would touch that which is the treasure of the church, our belief, that which constitutes the gospel. And we are again asking the question, is it still worth doing? Did Martin Luther have it right when he posted the 95 Thesis spawning the Reformation, or was he wrong? What is the right stance towards the Reformation of the 16th century, and what is its relevance to us in this 21st century? So let us consider here the importance of what happened. The historian Philip Schaff says the Reformation of the 16th century is, next to the introduction of Christianity, the greatest event in history. It marks the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of modern times. Starting from religion, it gave, directly or indirectly, a mighty impulse to every forward movement and made Protestantism the chief propelling force in the history of modern civilization. Now, a more modest assessment is another historian, Dyer Maid McCulloch, who said it is impossible to understand modern Europe without understanding the 16th century upheavals in Latin Christianity. 
They represented the greatest fault line to appear in Christian culture since the Latin and Greek halves of the Roman Empire went their separate ways a thousand years before. Now, speaking of the Latin and Greek halves, uh, Makulok is referring to the western part of the empire, the Latin speaking, and the eastern side, which is the Greek speaking, when they divided in 1054. Since then, the greatest event that explains whatever happened subsequently was the Reformation. That is the assessment of this leading historian. So we are now asking the question, what was it all about? Now, they are still celebrating the 500th year of the Reformation in Germany, in uh, Luther's hometown or uh, in the town where he ministered, which is now called Lutherstadt Witten Wittenberg, uh, there is still a statue by Martin Luther, and people are celebrating whatever happened, but I think in a very, on a very wrong ground. So we are asking the question, what was, why did Luther do it? What was it that propelled him to nail the 95 Theses challenge the church and without realizing it spawning a great movement of history there have been many suggestions there were th there are those who say that behind the act of luther is nothing more than political after all germany during that time was emergent in its nationalism and was prepared to challenge the roman catholic church and then there's there are still those who suggest that the reason or the motive was economic uh, there had been suspicions and jealousy entertained by the royalties of Europe because of the vast wealth of the church. And merchants were against. Uh, we heard about the sin tax and many other things that the church imposed on merchants and they did not want to pay taxes. And because of that, they were ready, they say, for the Reformation. And there are even those who suggest the real reason was personal because on that day, Martin Luther had a bad case of constipation. Sira ang tiyan, kaya nagka-reformasyon. Masyadong nakaririn din naman ng mga ganyang pagdadahilan. The real reason is theological. And not only Christian historians acknowledge that, here is a quote from a secular historian, Judd Whitney Hall, in his book, History of the World, Earliest Times to the Present Day, he said, Luther's ideas, his tenacity and conviction would also rally large number of Germans to his side. For the next 150 years, Germany and much of Western Europe would find itself in a turmoil of social unrest, war and insurrection. The small peak of the indulgence question rested upon a pyramid of Catholic theology and practice whose foundations were centuries old. I'll end the quotation there. He is admitting that the real reason why it spawned such a gigantic movement in Europe was because that little issue of indulgence, Luther touched a whole pyramid, a whole mountain of theological issues. And then from an evangelical historian, Matthew Barrett, he said, countless historians have gone to great lengths to explain the Reformation through social, political, and economic causes. No doubt each of these played a role during the Reformation and at times a significant role. Yes, most, yet most fundamentally, the Reformation was a theological movement caused by doctrinal concerns. Though political, social, and economic factors were important, observes Timothy George, we must recognize that the Reformation was essentially a religious event, its deepest concerns theological. What this means then is that we must be concerned with a theological self-understanding of the reformers. And there is, I believe, the right appreciation of what happened during the Reformation, uh, not political, not economic, whatever role they played, the real and most fundamental issue was theological. For Martin, for Martin Luther, how is one to be accepted by God? Remember, this was the time that Johann Tetzel was going around Europe selling indulgences, the papal guarantee 
that the souls from purgatory will spring with liberty and going to heaven. And uh, Martin Luther was challenging that. So this was theological for Martin Luther. And the bigger issue for him was how is man sinful that he is to be accepted by God? In Reformation language, justification before God. So this was the issue for Martin Luther, theological. And now, what is its relevance to us? Is it still relevant at all? We are going to consider first the positions taken by those who are not sympathetic to the Reformation for the 21st century. There are those who say that the Reformation was a mistake. There is the popular writer G.K. Chesterton who said, I am fully convinced that the Reformation of the 16th century was as near as any mortal thing can come to unmixed evil. Even the parts of, it, parts of it that might appear plausible and enlightened from a purely secular standpoint have turned out rotten and reactionary. Also from a purely secular standpoint, by substituting the Bible for the sacrament, it created a pedantic caste of those who could read superstitiously identified with those who could think. So that is a popular writer, but take it even from an evangelical leader in England, David Watson, in his address to the National Evangelicals, Evangelical Anglican Conference in 1977. He said in many ways the Reformation was one of the greatest tragedies that ever happened to the church. Now, why would uh, a person who is supposed to be an heir of the Reformation take that position? Now, the most common reasons given or advanced first is because of the irreparable division in Christendom. Nagkahati-hati ang sangkakristyanuhan, may katoliko, may protestante, hindi lamang naghati theologically, and we cannot deny from history that there were wars fought on the basis of this religious division. And that's for the whole of Christendom. And then add to that, among Protestants, there had been multiple, multiple divisions as a result of the Reformation. And for these reasons, you have this idea that the Reformation was wrong in introducing such a division in Christendom and creating many divisions among Protestants. If I can only give a very brief answer, I would say it is better to divide on the issue of truth than to unite in error. Mas mabuting magkatalo-talo tayo sa paghahanap ng katotohanan kaysa walang pag-iisip na tanggapin na lamang ang itinuro sa atin ng simbahan. So this is one position. I'm sure not many evangelicals will share that position. But then there are evangelicals who take the position that the Reformation has served its purpose. In other words, it was good for its time, but it should no longer divide in this 21st century. And you have a very respectable scholar, evangelical scholar, who takes that position in the person of Mark Knoll, and in partnership with Caroline Nystrom, they wrote, is the Reformation over? And that is the position that he is taking. And that position can be summarized by a review done by Kenneth Woodward on a biography by Martin Martis, Martin Luther, where he said, Luther could not, of course, have foreseen that the Church of Rome would some four centuries later at Vatican Council II adopt many of the reforms that he championed. So in other words, Luther did it right at a time that the Roman Catholic Church was uh, helplessly corrupt, both in doctrine and in morals. He did it then correctly, but that no longer applies to the Church, the Roman Catholic Church of today. After all, the Roman Catholic Church has changed, and he cites uh, the Second Vatican Council. Now, remember that the Roman Catholic Church, after the Reformation, had three councils, only three, since the Reformation. From 1545 to 1563 was the Council of Trent. 
known in history as the Count Catholic Counter Reformation. Then in 1870, uh, in a brief council that was immediately adjourned, it defined papal infallibility. And then 1962 to 1965, you have the Second Vatican Council, which we can call the mod modernization and the moderation of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, the argument advanced is whatever was right of the Reformation for the 16th century that will no longer apply to the 21st century of our day because the Roman Catholic Church has changed. Now, that, those are the positions that I do not accept, and I trust that I will give a more positive uh, assertion of what should be the position to take, and this is it. That the Reformation was a beginning, and it should continue to challenge in our day. Challenge now in two fronts. In saying this, first of all, we are not ignoring real positive changes in the Roman Catholic Church. Now, there can be an extreme conservatism that does not see anything good in the Roman Catholic Church, and that would be a denial even of what the Reformers have acknowledged in their day. Some changes have happened. As I've said, of the three councils that have been convened since, the Second Vatican Council introduced some real changes. Uh, at least there is more gentle language, unlike the anathemas of the Council of Trent. Uh, we are no longer heretics, that is, evangelicals or Protestants are no longer considered heretics. We are now called separated brethren, at least must cute, diba? Uh, <laughs> but the most important change since the Second Vatican Council was the permission for the laity to read the Bible. And they say that in the De Verbum document of the Second Vatican Council. Now, we don't need to see some specious concession of the Roman Catholic Church in allowing that. Whatever it is, uh, that is beside the point because evangelicals should believe in the power of God's Word. Once it is opened, you never know what the Holy Spirit can do to open up the words of Scripture and make them grip the mind of a reader who is honestly seeking the truth. And that would not have been possible if the Bible was still forbidden reading. So on that account alone, there has been real changes and we are not being blind to them. So in making this position, uh, this is one caveat. We are not being blind, we are not ignoring the positive changes in the Roman Catholic Church. Also, we are not blinding ourselves to the flaws of the Reformers. The Reformers were men. They were great men, but they were but men. And they had their flaws, serious flaws. They were, in the language of 2 Corinthians 4, 7, they had their treasure in earthen vessel or jars of clay. Mga marurupok na sisidlan, ganyan ang mga reformers, hindi sila supermen. Martin Luther had his serious flaws. One of the most serious was his anti-Semitism. He was anti-Jewish. He wrote a book against the Jews in which he proposed the burning of their synagogues and many other acts which to his credit he never performed. But generations later, another would take him seriously and justify his case, Adolf Hitler. So one cannot sympathize with views like that, which only shows the reality of the humanity, even the sinfulness of the reformers, yet they were used by God. I think the right position is expressed by the evangelical reformed historian Nick Needham, who said, no one entirely transcends his culture. It would be an arrogant and romantic delusion of sinless perfection that thought so. And in many ways, the protest Protestant reformers were profoundly people of their own times as we are of ours. We shouldn't expect perfection in them any more than a future generation will discover perfection in us. We will certainly find, though, as we immerse ourselves in the Reformation era, that all human life 
is here. So in other words, the point is, uh, we acknowledge the fault, the humanity, the sinfulness of the reformers, yet that should not blind us to the fact that they were earthen vessels in whom God put his treasure. And we will be the losers if because there was a servitus case to Calvin and there was an anti-Semitism in Luther and many such other faults, we totally and sweepingly reject the reformers and that is to reject a vast episode of the work of God in His providence. We would be the losers for that. So we are not blinding ourselves to their position, so to their flaws and faults. Uh, so why then do we say we still must press on with what began in the Reformation? There are now two fronts. First, Reformation is still needed in the Roman Catholic Church. In other words, the same front that began in 1517, that is still with us today. And especially here in the Philippines, where we still have the Roman Catholic Church in dominance in our society, what Martin Luther rejected and challenged in his day, and what the Reformers challenged in their day, we must still challenge in our day and perhaps the Roman Catholic Church now has more sophistication, now has more enlightenment and yet the very uh, kernel of theology is still in the body of the Roman Catholic Church. It is still essentially holding to the theology of Trent. Trent gave the most official definition of the Roman Catholic theology and there are many who think that the Second Vatican Council has reversed trend. It did not. In fact, there is an explicit statement in the Second Vatican Council that it is following the previous councils and particularly the previous two councils which were Trent and the First Vatican Council of 1870. So no matter the changes externally, policy-wise, Theologically, the Roman Catholic Church is the same church that Luther denounced in his 1517 Reformation. So we are still at it. And even though there might be a spirit of gentleness that characterizes Roman Catholic discourse, they are not redefining the doctrines of the clergy. The transubstantiation is still there. And uh, the idea of justification with works in it are still there. And many other doctrines that Martin Luther and the Reformers denounced, they're still there. And if we believe that the gospel has not changed from the New Testament going through the history of the church, then that same gospel is still here, and that same gospel still denounces any works morality, any works justification, and therefore the Reformation must move on. But I want to go more substantially, the more important front as far as we are concerned, the new front of the Reformation battle is in evangelical churches among those who pro profess to be heirs of the Reformation, and this is a real sad reality, uh, that the Reformers who should most espouse, the Evangelicals rather, who should most espouse what the Reformers stood for, are now leading in the travesty of their theology. Let us consider the solace of the Reformation, sola scriptura, the so-called formal principle of the Reformation, that which sets the Reformation apart from the Roman Catholic Church before justification by faith is the source of authority. Is it traditions? Is it the Pope? Is it the Church? And the, the Reformers stood on its head, the Roman Catholic position that the Scriptures are held and are founded upon the church by saying, no, the church is founded upon scriptures. 
and scriptures interpret themselves rather than the clergy interpreting scriptures. Now, evangelicals today, sadly, accept extra revelations and, in fact, worse than the Roman Catholic Church in many ways. No pope can advance a new position without first a study of well-chosen theologians of the church. Well, today, in any church, somebody can stand and say, I have a prophecy from the Lord. And everybody listens. Anybody can profess to have had a dream and vision, and everybody thinks he's a special one. Rather than the evangelical, historic evangelical position uh, and the Reformation position that the revelation of God, the Word of God, has been given through the Scriptures and with the close of the canon, so did the Word of God. There is no more word, new Word of God today. There is the fresh Word of God from Scriptures, but not a new Word. The Word of God is now that which is written. And no one can say, however remarkably he may claim he has a dream, he has a vision, or others would claim to popularity and to majority for the persuasion of the church that has not been the Reformation position. And with the compromise of that, evangelical churches are in a much worse position than did the Roman Catholic Church when it comes to the source of revelation. Why, why do you do what you do in your church, in your way of evangelism, in your way of teaching, even in the people who constitute the offices of the church? I do not sympathize with John Knox's first blast of trumpet against the monstrous rule of women. But I do believe in the New Testament rule that the office of the church, the pastoral office, is not for women. Not that women are inferior, they are not. But God has so assigned what He will put into His own mandated office. So why are there so many pastoras in churches today? Where did they get that from the Scripture? Obviously, it's not from the Scripture. And this is just a case, one case of something done in evangelical churches that is not sola scriptura. And I can cite more, but this is one case. And then let's move on to sola fide. Sola fide is the formal principle, the, the material principle of the Reformation in which Martin Luther says one is justified by faith alone. Although that faith is not alone because it is productive of good works, but the instrumental cause of one's acceptance with God is his faith alone. Faith that in the figure that is one of Luther's favorites, like that of a beggar receiving the alms, the gift of God. And the focus, therefore, is on the giver and the gift. What happened in evangelicalism is a reductionism in which saving faith is reduced to decisionistic evangelism. The idea that it is reduced to formulated steps, how you can be a believer by raising your hand and following a dictated prayer and by having formulas like receiving Jesus into my heart and all these things make Faith, the focus, rather than in Luther's language, faith's focus is upon the giver and the gift. Today, the preoccupation is, have I accepted? Have I? And all the focus is on the self. Sola fide has yielded to formulas, to decisionism. And for that reason, there is an important reformation needed in the evangelical church. If the reformers denounce the sacramentalism of the Roman Catholic Church, there is a new form of sacramentalism in evangelical churches. The baptismal font is now changed, substituted by the altar call. 
and make it the means by which one has relationship with God. And we can cite again on and on, but let's move on to the next. Sola gratia. Arminianism has become prevalent in evangelical theology. Now, grace is still a favorite vocabulary in evangelical churches. But again, it has been reduced to salvation by grace only in contrast with salvation by works. And I think they think that has exhausted grace for them. But as we have heard, uh, the reformers were to a man believers of God's electing grace. God's predestinating sovereignty. And that is hardly heard today except to be criticized and to be denounced by evangelicals. But that's what grace was. So we talk of doctrines of grace. But today in evangelical churches, grace is no more than just believing. I don't believe in salvation by works. And I believe in salvation by grace. And that's it. And that needs to be reformed. That needs to be changed. Then Solus Christus, I can only repeat what Luther said of, his, of the clergy of his day. They say cross, cross, when there is no cross. In other words, you still hear the cross vocabulary in evangelical churches, and yet the cross is used as therapeutic, psychological, a proof of one's value. A proof of how one is important to God, which stands grace on its head. Because the cross is telling people that though you are a sinner, though you are the object of God's wrath, yet God in His grace has sent His Son. Well, today they are telling you, look at, the, look at Christ on the cross. He did that because you are important to Him. And that is a total reversal of the meaning of the cross. And that is the reason why people citing the cross then turn to themselves. How important they are, how valuable they are. And the self-esteem language of psychology has been closed with Christian vocabulary, but it is not scripture. So solus Christus has yielded to psychology, therapy, and chemistry. And finally, solid Deo Gloria. That the glory of God alone is the center, the object of the Christian life, of church order, and most dramatically displayed in worship. When it is all about God. When people are awed in the presence of God. Do you see that in the average worship of evangelical churches today where man-centered entertainment atmosphere is prevalent? Just imagine yourself. In Isaiah 6, Isaiah was before Yahweh who reveals himself as holy, holy, holy. And what does he see? He sees the cherubim and the seraphim sinless creatures they have no sin yet what are we told of their posture before God they were covering their faces they were in full reverence before God I mean can you imagine the seraphim and cherubim all drumming up and dancing before Yahweh on his throne of course not reverence was the order of their worship of God that's solid Deo Gloria that's God, holy, holy, holy. And that is not what you see in evangelical churches today. So my friends, what are we to do of the Reformation of the 16th century? Well, I say it has even widened the battlefront. We are still in the battlefront with the Roman Catholic Church. Whatever changes that have happened, it is still the Catholic Church defined by Trent. And now, a more fierce battle against those who should be the heirs of the Reformation, and that is evangelical churches. And so my contention for this session is to simply say, we are thankful for the Reformation of the 16th century, but the battle is not over. 
There is no announcement of liberation. The announcement is the battle must go on. And because of that, this should continue. By the blessing of God, last February, we had in this same venue, the pastor's conference uh, with more than 300 re registering and in attendance. And this is going on in other churches as well. Uh, in last two weeks ago, in our own church, together with, in partnership with Trinity Bible Church of San Pablo, we had a reformed and reforming conference, and I'm challenging you. I know there was one in Santa Rosa, and there will be one in San Simon Pampanga, where I will be going on Tuesday. And there are these little conferences going on, modest by standard of popular evangelicalism, but nonetheless, the seed is being sown. And I'm saying that we should continue the challenge that started with Martin Luther's nailing of the 95 Thesis. It must continue on, and this is to be driven by the conviction that, as John Calvin puts it, the excellence of the church does not consist in multitude, but in purity. There is a mad race for getting more number and using every gimmickry in the book just to get more number. And it is good to be reminded that for the reformers like John Calvin, the health of the church is not in numbers, but in the purity of its doctrine, in the purity of its regenerate membership, and in the purity of its discipline. Let us go back to the original slogan of the Reformation, Justificatio Articulus Stantis Velcadentis Ecclesiae. Justification is the article of a standing or falling church. You want a robust church. It's not in gimmickry, my brethren. It is in believing that what we find in the New Testament, what we find in the book of Romans, and what animated Martin Luther on that day to challenge the indulgences which led to the shaking of the whole church and the redirection of history is still the same truth that must animate us today. I know that many of you have heard of my hospitalization just a few months ago. I was in the ICU for four days where I teetered between life and death. And I pray that if God would ever spare my life, it will be for the purpose of whatever is still for the reformation of this country. Pastor Ellis and I, I accept, will not live to see the fruition of this reformation. But I see young men and women before me, and that I believe, as long as there are those whose hearts throb with love for the truth and conviction that it is still the truth that must be pressed in our day, then the Reformation is alive for our generation. Let us pray. Our gracious Father, we are awed by your work in providence in the application of the truth with its power using men of earthen vessels, jars of clay, weak and frail men that they were, yet because of the treasure of the truth, they were used. And it is our prayer that in our own generation, you would use us. We see so much that still cries out for the truth that once rang in the 16th century that still needs to be pressed in our day. Father, give us the grace to be worthy of your call in our generation to press home the need for reformation in the Roman Catholic Church and sadly even among our brethren in evangelical churches. But let us help us, Lord, to believe that it is still the same word it is still the same grace, and it is still the same power that is with us in order to advance the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we count it a privilege and a mission 
to be so used for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.